Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Frontiers in Brain Health, where we're taking a deep dive into some of the most exciting neuroscience research um, that's happening. This is a hybrid event where you're recording. Um, so welcome to those joining us online, and we will uh, get to questions at the end in which uh, we will take some questions from the uh, virtual audience in addition to the live audience. And if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function within the um, the interface. So uh, today is going to be our celebration of working memory, that elusive, mysterious, critical skill that helps us manage our lives. And um, I'm going to introduce uh, some of the the speakers, beginning with uh, a major hub and fixture in the working memory community and the frontal lobe neurology community, Dr. Mark Desposito, who is uh, one of the most prolific mentors um, of cognitive neuroscientists, as well as a major, major player in this for a really long time. So he's going to introduce our main speakers. Mark. Thank you. So I'm visiting from UC Berkeley, but I've been visiting here for almost 20 years, and uh, it keeps getting better every year. So I'm going to introduce our speakers, Dr. Aaron Seitz and Dr. Susan Yagi, who so excited to be here today. Um, they're visiting from Northeastern University, where they recently moved their labs from Irvine and uh, Irvine and Riverside, UC Riverside. Um, so Aaron started his scientific career at. Uh, at Boston University where he got his PhD and then went to University of Washington where he did his postdoc and, and Susan started off in Switzerland, University of Bern, and then uh, to Michigan for her postdoc. Uh, even though Michigan and Washington are, are both very prestigious places, Michigan clearly has the better football team. We, we, could, we could admit to that, right? Although they both were, what were second, third, what was Washington? Second, third, or cl cl they did okay this year, yeah. Um, so both of them, uh, they, have ver they both have outstanding research programs that are unique, but I want to just sort of emphasize the, the similarities, and that's what they'll emphasize today, that they're both interested in studying the highest level abilities, like, like working memory across a lifespan, trying to understand the neural mechanisms of these high level b abilities, um, as well as, uh, as, as sort of understand the individual differences that we have. But importantly for today's talk, they've been really... Um, forced to be reckoned with in terms of being able to sort of study how we can actually uh, develop metrics that, that uh, can, can measure these, these complex abilities and how we can develop uh, training to try and improve these, these abilities. And so this obviously is very similar to the goals of the Brain Health Center. Um, and we're excited to start collaborating with them. One of the reasons for their visits today, besides to give you this wonderful talk and introduce themselves, is that we hope to be seeing them a lot more. I guess we will be sort of collaborating on a number of projects along our sort of similar interests. So as I understand it, they're not going to speak like alternate word to word or sentence to sentence. They're going to speak separately, uh, but, but uh, give sort of both of their perspectives on promoting cognitive health and well-being across the lifespan. Who's starting? I guess I'll start. Okay. Thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I'm excited about the possibility of collaborating with Brain Health, um, and I think you'll see from the talk that our goals are very much aligned. Um, and so both Susan and I are kind of new at Northeastern, so we've created a group called the Sound Mind Collaboratory, and then also the Brain Game Center for Mental um, Fitness and Well-Being. And so. With the Brain Game Center for Mental Fitness and Well-Being, what we've been really trying to do is kind of understand, you know, what are the basic processes of the brain, ranging from perception, which I'll start talking about, um, to higher level processes like memory. Um, and that really it's an observation that everything that we do is by having our brain circuits operate in a way that's either effective to reach our goals or perhaps not. In that case, we want to figure out how we can make them more effective. And so our mission really is that um, we develop new approaches that we study and research, um, and then we try to disseminate these um, with the goal that we want everything to benefit real life activities. And we have a fairly broad research profile, so there's a lot of work that we do that's focused on healthy aging, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, and 
pretty much everything is the balance of trying to understand individual needs and then trying to personalize the interventions that we have. Um, we also do a lot of work on educating children. There's some work that's focused more on perception with hearing needs and vision needs. A lot of work focused on memory and attention. We look at lots of different approaches, including benefits of art and music. We address people with different mental health um, needs. We even do some interventions with obesity in terms of inhibitor control training. We've worked at workplaces. And then a lot of what we do is leverage technology to be able to make it so that we can create systems that will reach people in their own homes. And a big center of what we do is kind of on this idea of brain training. And that the way that I think of it is that if you look at how we understand the body, so like you know, if you want to train an athlete, the reason that we have athletes that are able to run faster, jump higher, um, you know, run further than ever before, is that there's a lot of scientific knowledge that we developed in terms of how the cardiovascular system works and muscle physiology. And this knowledge has in helped enhance athletic training. At the same time, we know a lot about psychology and neuroscience. And so the goal is how can we harness this knowledge in order to be able to come up with better ways to train the brain? And that when it comes down to it, you know, people have always looked at approaches to be able to strengthen cognitive processing. And so some examples you have are like Mensa problems or Sudoku, Wordle, crossword puzzles, readings. All of these things are beneficial activities. A challenge, though, has been that you definitely will get better at these. Sometimes they will transfer to other aspects of your lives, but they often won't kind of generalize too far to you know, broader cognitive tasks. And so that, um, in contrast to this, there's kind of more and more groups that are creating these neuroscience-inspired games. Um, and that you know, it seems like every couple weeks, there's another group of companies that come out. And there's a lot of conversation in terms of, do these things work or do they not work? Um, and in fact, there was um, a statement that a number of scientists came out with a number of of years ago, where this was Stanford Institute of Longevity and Max Planck Institute of Human Development. And the key points they made was that, at that point, there was no compelling scientific evidence to date. But the way we encourage continued careful research and validation in the field. And what this means is that there's a lot of controversy about what might be the ways to be able to improve brain health. Um, and in order to cut through that controversy, we need to have better studies to be able to get more concrete evidence. Um, and that you know the controversy isn't that one can't accomplish this. It's that we need to make sure that we have the right data so we understand which approaches are beneficial and which are not. And a lot of the problems that people have brought up in the literature is this issue of specificity. Another term for this would be teaching to the test. And so this is an example of um, the NBAC test. So this is where the standard approach that people will either use to test working memory or to train it in this case. And that your activity in this task is that as you go screen to screen, that this blue square changes its location. So it's first in the lower right, then it's the lower left, then it's the lower right again. That matches what you saw two items ago. And so that would be a target of the two back. Then you can look at the next one, upper middle. It doesn't match. Lower middle doesn't match. Upper middle, yes, two ago, it matches. You could train somebody on this task, as Susan has done. And that basically, this is data showing college students where they started around the two or three back. And then after about 10 or 20 days of training, they could get to like the five or six back. So now you could say, what did you see five items ago? Um, and they could say, yeah, blue square, lower middle. And you know, some people will get to like 10 or 15 back. It's really impressive how good some people could get at this. You know, oh, I saw that item 15 items ago. The big question, though, um, is that you, know, you go to the grocery store, and do you remember what you're supposed to get? <laughs> and sometimes yes, sometimes no. And so this is really what we're trying to solve, is that we want to not just learn specifically how to perform well on these training tasks. We want you to be able to do your daily activities. And the extent to which those rely upon things like working memory, that you should be able to do those better. And so I started um, in this field um, thinking about like what would be 
the right way to make training programs that would lead to real world benefits. And I started studying vision. And so there's a whole field of visual perceptual learning that's focused on how we could train the visual system to be able to learn better. And I'll talk you through a little bit of um, that type of work. And so the basic idea is that your ability to see is a collaboration between how your eye works. And so like in my case, I'm wearing glasses because light's not being focused properly to the back of my retina if I take them off. Put them back on, focus is better. That's half the job. The other job is that my brain needs to be able to read the information from my eye and process in a way that's useful for me to be able to perceive things. And that the reality is, is that as we get older, um, so the term presbyopia for aging eye, and that a lot of people talk about this as being a change of elasticity of the eye that uh, might require reading glasses and things of that sort. But the brain also is starting to struggle in terms of its ability to do the visual tasks. And that if you really want to be able to get the best outcomes, you want to do things that are going to both help the brain and also help the eye. And in terms of evidence that um, we're able to train our vision, take an example of radiologists. So this is a picture of a femur bone where there's some lithic metastases. So these are cancerous outgrowths of the bone. Um, I know there's some doctors in the house, and the question is, can you find um, these metastases? Um, I could highlight them. And so you could now kind of look at the areas that are highlighted. I could take it away. And you could kind of remember like, you know, oh yeah, it looks a little bit darker in some of those spots. Maybe that's it. But when it comes down to those other parts on the bone that are not darker, that are also, can that, aren't, that are darker but not cancerous. And so um, it's more than just being able to kind of look at these gross features. You really need to refine your visual system's ability to see subtle contrast and subtle orientations. And then often takes you know, experience with you know, 50, 100,000 images in order to be really able to train this. And so a radiologist can literally see things that an untrained individual cannot. And so this is an example of how the visual system is able to really refine its basic practices even in adulthood. In the lab, we typically study this with much simpler stimuli. And so in this case, if you kind of look at the little red dots you see on the top, on the right, you could see that there's a little oriented um, pattern tilted a little bit to the left. And if you kind of follow the dots from right to left, what you see is it becomes harder and harder to find that pattern. And so in the lab, we typically would come up with this idea that, um, you know, the, your performance, um, your ability to say that you saw it or not, um, will increase with the signal strength. And then we could train somebody you know, for 10, 20 days. And what we'll find is that after training, they'll be able to see, um, you know, perform better with the same stimulus than before training. And so there's hundreds of studies, actually thousands of studies, where people have done these types of perceptual learning. And pretty much anything that you could come up with, not just these vision tasks, like wine tasting, you can basically train somebody in wines, and they'll be just able to distinguish them a little bit better. They'll probably stop liking the less expensive wines. They have to spend more to get enjoyment. Um, but like this is perceptual learning again. Um, and so we know that you know, our perception can be improved. But what's interesting about this field of perceptual learning is that the learning can be exquisitely specific to the details of the training. So for instance, if I trained you in this task, where you're kind of staring at the red dot and basically the oriented pattern is the lower right hand visual field. And I trained you, let's say, for a week or two. And then I tested you when that same stimulus was the upper left hand visual field. Learning often will not transfer that task. It kind of seems strange, right? It's the same stimulus. Like your knowledge of it um, should be able to transfer. But oftentimes it doesn't. I could rotate that stimulus 90 degrees and then test you in that new stimulus. Oftentimes, the learning doesn't transfer. Some of the most exquisite um, and surprising evidence is specificity of the eye of training. So I could either patch one of your eyes or kind of use one of these head-mounted displays where different information is shown to each eye. And I could train you on the task for, once again, you know, a week or two. Your performance will get better. If I then switch so you're now seeing it in the other eye, what often happens not always, is that the learning starts similar to where the first eye had to train. And you can see that the curve goes up faster, so there are some savings. 
but that this is interesting in the sense that if I set this up properly, you cannot tell me whether the stimulus was shown to your left or right eye. You don't have conscious awareness of this. But what's happening, we think, is that in the visual system, when you set the task up so that you have to do these very precise judgments, that it's very early on in the visual system where the neurons will have plasticity and improve the performance in being able to discriminate the stimulus. And those early cells don't see information from both eyes. They don't see information from all of the visual field. They just see some small areas. And that um, as neuroscientists, we learn a lot about how the visual system works from this. But if you came into my lab and you wanted to improve your vision, and I said, OK, I'm going to train you for 20 days. And afterwards, in your left eye, in the upper left hand visual field, if the stimulus is tilted to the right, you'll see it better. But nowhere else, it's probably not what you want. And so, like my research, you know, for the first um, you know decade and a half of my career was all doing those types of studies, and um, you know I learned a lot from it. But the question is, like, why is this specific? And one of the answers is that if you train with very simple stimuli, like you know whether it's just an acuity task of, you know, with these C's, you know, can you find the smallest gap or the contrast of that oriented pattern or that oriented pattern of noise, and that you only train in one location, um, in one eye with one stimulus, why should your visual system learn to generalize? I've even trained an artificial neural network on how to do this task. And if I train it where I just have these, you know, very limited stimuli, it alters the specificity. It doesn't generalize when I move it to another location. On the other hand, if I train it with a variety of features, it does generalize. And so the thing which you know, was really a turning point in my career was when I started thinking about how do I create things that will transfer? And we'll talk to you a little bit it is about some of the thinking that I underwent and that this underlies how we treat things like working memory as well. And so this is my one neuroscience slide. And so what you'll see is that this is showing um, a human brain where you could see that, let's see, if you, you see my cursor here? I'm not sure, maybe not. But basically in the front you could see kind of light coming into the eye. And in the back, um, kind of the yellow and orange part, um, you know, the yellow is primary visual cortex and the orange is secondary visual cortex. And so those are the first parts of the neocortex that we'll see. So this is where the information for the eye is going. And there's a lot of foundational research teaching us about the structure of visual cortex. The first thing is what we call a retinotopy. And this is a fancy term just to say that um, neighboring locations in the eye project to neighboring location of the visual cortex. And so what you see in this figure is on the left, that's a pattern that was flashed on and off to a monkey for about like 45 minutes while it had ingested a metabolic stain that afterwards we were able to flatten the visual cortex and basically look at what is the image of the cells that are active during that manipulation. And we could see is that you could see that pattern actually on visual cortex. And so this is showing that visual cortex has a map of space. Like there's, you could find an X dimension and a Y dimension, you find a location that corresponds to visual cortex where it's going to see um, a given spot shown on the retina. That's one dimension. The other thing is if you stick an electrode and you record from individual neurons, what you find is that they each have some preference to the orientation of the stimulus. Some like you know, my hand when it's vertical. Some might like it horizontal. Others are orientations. And across all the different cells, you find that every orientation is represented. And I'll explain in a moment why this is important. Another dimension, and this one's a little bit more complicated, is what we call spatial frequency. And so if I show you these same patterns, but if sometimes if the, these fuzzy blobs are wider and other times narrower, they will find that different cells will respond to either the wide ones or the narrow ones. And so what's interesting about this 
is that if you kind of study math or physics, you might have come across something called a Fourier transform, which is basically, it's a fancy way for describing um, a way to take a bunch of filters, things like these fuzzy blobs, and mathematically describe an image by the numbers that those filters would generate if applied. And so this sounds a little complicated, but the simple way to think about it is that going back to space, um, if you want to describe any point in a plane, that you describe that point by an x coordinate and a y coordinate. That's a basis function. If you want to understand something in 3D space, you have your x and y and z. If you want to understand it in terms of these filters, you just need your x, your y, your orientation, and your spatial frequency. And this is actually how your phone compresses information. So when you take a picture with your phone, what it does is it applies a grid um, to, in this case, a woman's face. And that um, the tightness of the grid indicates the resolution that that photo is going to be saved at. At each grid location, it applies this filter bank that you see on the left, where if you look at that first column, what you see is that all of them are horizontal. If you look at that first row, they're all vertical. So there are different spatial frequencies. And then the plaids in between are just mathematically comparable to other orientations. And so what it's doing is it's just get, assigning a number of how well each of those filters match that location. And this is how your phone compresses information. It seems our brain actually compresses information in a very similar way. In fact, Jacob compression was modeled after our understanding of how the brain uh, processes information. And the reason I'm taking you through this is it goes back to if I wanted to train somebody to see better, if I'm able to train across these different dimensions, different locations, different orientations, different spatial frequencies, and if this is how the brain breaks down information, then if I train this way, then maybe I could train something that will generalize to other tasks. And there's a bunch of other principles that you know, we've looked at in terms of training. It's like, you know, how do we add reward? Because we know that things like dopamine are really important in terms of how the brain learns. So why don't we make sure that dopamine is released at the right times when people are seeing stimuli they want to learn? Or how do you train people to focus their attention on what you want? Or use the senses together? Um, or there's approaches where you could basically put electrical impulses into the brain to kind of help with the learning process. Or games, learning through fun. And so like, what we've been trying to do is kind of systematically break down all these elements of like, what are the things you want to train? And how do you train them well? And this is what we could hypothesize would lead to something that would transfer as opposed to these other studies that don't have these design principles that might not. And so with this, let's see if this video plays. Yeah, so this was the first um, kind of vision training game I made. So it was originally with a company where we sold it as Ultimize. Um, we now have a lab version that we make that we call Sightseeing, which is actually, it's a free download on the App Store. And that what we're doing here is basically at these different locations, you're seeing these fuzzy blobs that I've been talking about that the visual cortex really like. And they're presented at different spatial frequencies and different orientations. At each point, it measures your ability to discriminate them and makes it harder and harder and harder. And so it basically kind of pushes your limit to be able to perform this. And so the first thing when I started along this path was like, I wanted to have a game that I'd hypothesize should lead to broad-based vision improvements. The next question is, how do you measure something that somebody's already doing and see whether that's benefited from your training? And so, I approached um, the head coach of the UC Riverside baseball team, and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to engage your players in a science experiment, and he looked at me a little bit funny. Um, I then continued to say, well, you know, if you start looking at, you know, a lot of major league teams, you know, they do vision training of different types in their players, and that, you know, this is something which is, can be really important to give you a competitive edge, and eventually it's like, okay, you can make a 1% improvement in how my team sees we're in. So they came to my lab um, for 30, 25 minute sessions um, during the fall. Um, and then we're able to measure their ability to see eye charts before and after that. 
And then also, since basically all baseball data is public, we could then take the performance um, in the season that um, was the year before they trained, and then the season that started three months after they finished training, and start looking to see, you know, do they do better in the field? Starting off with um, the eye charts, we could see that um, you know, on the left of the two bars are for the trained players, and that we saw that their distance vision um, improved by about 30%, so they could basically see the same text on the eye chart 30% further back after they their training. They also improved in near vision. Um, the pitchers who are the control group um, who did the same task, they didn't show any improvements, so this seemed to be specific to people who were trained. They're college athletes, so we also looked at things like reading speed, and the reading speed improved. I didn't get their grades, but you know, maybe we'll see. Um, and then the question is, they improve in baseball. And so the first thing we looked at was strikeouts. So we could basically look at change in strikeouts year over year, so 2012 baseball season versus 2013 after training. And so basically, higher is a reduction in strikeouts, so we didn't make them worse. Um, but basically, we found that there was a statistically significant reduction in strikeouts for the UC Riverside team versus um, the rest of the players in the Big West League. Um, and that actually, we went back five years. This is the only example in five years that any team had a significantly significant reduction in strikeouts compared to the rest of the league um, over that period. We could also start using like money ball statistics like um, there's a measure called runs created per out. And so this is, you could look at hitting in a way that kind of ignores fielding and kind of estimate, you know, how many runs did the team cr create per out? And we could look at this in terms of the change um, for the UC Riverside team versus the change in the Big West League. So, you know, they're, you know, both teams are getting, you know, better across years. But then there's something called the Pythagorean theorem of baseball. So you could take these runs created, you could compare this to runs allowed, the um, runs the other team scored on you. And you could estimate how many games should you have won based upon that performance. And we could do this both assuming that they improved at the UC Riverside rate or at the Big West League rate and take the difference. And the difference was um, 4.7 games out of a 54 game season. So basically 8% more games won um, from this type of training. And like, if we had a longer conversation, you know, there's all sorts of things we could talk about, like small sample sizes, other controls could be done, et cetera, and so on. The point I want to make is not that like, my vision training is the best ever. It's that if you want to do research in this space, if you're able to come up with a training that you'd hypothesize to give rise to real world benefits, and you test people in the real world, this is where we want to go as a field. And so kind of the summary of the vision training is that we know the visual system um, shows a great deal of plasticity, even in adults, across the lifespan. We need to recognize that when we start reading papers in scientific journals, these lab-based studies are often trying to understand something about mechanisms and very specific um, components of research that might not be what we're looking for in clinical practice. If you really want to create something that is going to help people, you really need to have a principal design framework to achieve this broad transfer and real world relevance. And so the next question is like, can these types of design thinking apply to other cognitive skills? And Susan will take over. All right, exactly. Thank you, Aaron. And also thanks for having um, us and we're really excited. So let's switch topic from the visual field to working memory, which is one of the domains where we have been particularly interested in understanding whether and to the extent to which we could possibly improve working memory. So first of all, what is working memory? So working memory is a very important process uh, of our brain that allows us to uh, intake, update, and maintain uh, and manipulate rele uh, relevant information. Uh, it usually only um, lasts for a couple of seconds, but this is enough for us to work with the information that we have to do other important things like following a conversation, remembering where we were on the page on the books after we have looked up uh, and, and were distracted by a little bit. Working memory allows us to kind of keep that in mind to find that the, the, 
the space where we are on the page. Um, it's really essential in pretty much every day, everything that we do in our daily life, and it's also highly predictive, so it, it, it's very, um, very much associated with how well we do in school and how well we cognitively age. And it's also uh, impaired in a number of developmental and um, clinical disorders. So think of uh, ADHD, for example, or major depression, where often some challenges with working memory occur. And it's also one of these functions that decreases uh, with age. So when we look at cognition across the lifespan, um, there's a number of cognitive functions like our experiences, vocabulary, general knowledge. We continue to accumulate this our, uh, across our entire lives. But working memory, uh, uh, along with a, a, a number of other cognitive skills, shows this nice inverted U-shaped curve where our undergraduates does, that some of us teach usually outperform us in any of these tasks. And as we get older, we get worse at, um, at these um, skills. But that doesn't mean it's immutable. So the, the good news about this is that working memory can be improved. So we can exercise our uh, working memory skills and we can still contribute to maintaining um, healthy um, working memory skills as we age. So here I'm showing you a graph. So we have a number of studies um, uh, conducted with older ad adults, but also with other populations across the lifespan. If we give um, older adults these um, working memory tasks, such as the one that Aaron showed you earlier, the one with the blue squares, basically, um, people train on these tasks um, over a uh, across a couple of weeks. And you can see that they are getting better at these tasks. So they're actually quitting, getting quite impressively good. So Aaron was mentioning before, undergraduates can get up to a, a five back, but here older adults, they can get pretty, pretty close to the undergrads with training. So that means we can strengthen our working memory skills that way. The question is again, does it generalize? Does it go beyond that specific improvement in this uh, task? And here, what we were looking um, at, we were uh, conducting a meta-analysis in which we summarized um, um, studies that we have been conducted with these types of training tasks, looking at outcome measures after training that resemble pretty much um, the example that I'm giving you on the lower um, left here. So this is an example of a problem-solving task, a reasoning task, where you have to figure out what shape goes in that empty slot, where you have to kind of uh, find the logic behind that. So does training on working memory, so remembering an increasing number of items in, in, in your head, help you solve these problems for which we typically don't have any strategies or experience of having done so? So when you look at, across um, a number of these studies, it turns out that people who undergo this type of NBAC training over a couple of weeks, they underperform control um, uh, people, control individuals in these types of tasks um, after training. But we were kind of um, um, uh, also <coughs> criticized because these differences between the experimental group and the control group are not very big. So they're often very subtle. So we can translate these in about three to uh, four points on a standardized IQ scale, which is um, admittedly not very large. But what we have to keep in mind, and what we also discovered here, is that there are large differences between studies. Some of the studies found quite extensive differences between the experimental group and the control group, and some others find practically none. And the question is, where do these differences come from? And even within studies, we see large individual differences in terms of how much people improve in training. So this is uh, data from uh, older adults who underwent also this uh, kind of memory training. And I'm plotting here um, each individual training curve um, showing you how much they improve over time. And maybe you can see this bright um, green line that stands out a little bit. So here is a, an individual who shows quite impressive performance increases over time. But there are also other people like this yellow one on the very bottom. There's a person who, who um, almost not Im uh, doesn't improve at all. And the question is, why don't they improve at all? Why does this other person improve that much uh, in comparison? And what can we do to also help this person, this, this yellow person there, to also reach their potential and help them um, become better? 
And why do we want to do this? Why do we want to get um, people better in this training task? Because when we look at the transfer measures, at these out generalized outcome measures, at these IQ type spatial reasoning measures that we have been using as outcome measures, we saw that people here, the green bar, people improve a lot during training, these are the people who showed the largest improvement in these outcome measures um, as compared to those who have a very small training gain on the left where you can see no bar at all. So they also they didn't improve any, in, in any measurable extent in, in these transfer measures and the controls are somewhere in between. So that suggests that it's really important to make sure that people can improve in the training task itself in order then to also um, show um, benefits that go beyond the training task too. So again, how can we get there and what are some of the features that make or maximize the benefits of the training? And we have found that there's a, a, a number of features that are really important, so intervention-related features. For example, the time on task. So how long are you actually undergoing this training? Is it enough to just spend 20 minutes on this task and you're done? Probably not. So what we show here is that the longer people train or the longer people engage with this training task, the more benefits they show in these outcome measures, again, in these reasoning tasks. But beyond just time on task, there are also features that are important that Aaron was pointing out, uh, pointing out earlier. So here, what I'm showing you are training curves of um, different training uh, types that we uh, conducted with individuals, showing that uh, in the green and the red, so where, where we had specific types of training, so multi-sensory, where people had to deal with uh, auditory stimuli and visual stimuli at the same time, they did pretty well. Also just uh, dealing with visual information as compared to when someone was just doing an auditory task um, by itself, that was less beneficial. So there are other variants that we tried here, so this is just an example to illustrate that it also matters the type of stimuli and the type of training that you conduct in order to uh, improve some of these um, tasks. Um, so overall, um, here Erin already hinted um, in, uh, about this earlier, so we have to keep in mind that there's a lot of different ways the memory, um, our memory operates on. So we have a range of stimuli and senses that could be relevant and that could be amenable to training. And also, there's also different types within the working memory system and the executive uh, system that could also be useful to be training. We, we ranging from updating the contents of our memory to, to just boosting or, or working out capacity and, and, and its sense, also how closely and how, ex um, how um, precisely we can analyze certain things, also by association. All these things can be important and, and could be uh, trainable um, in, in, in a certain way how we, we do the task. And then the motivational framework is also very important um, too. So how can we get people to not only start to do training, but also continue to do training so they actually get the, the relevant number of sessions that they actually see the benefits. So there, a lot of work has been done and discussed in, in terms of gamifying the task, and I'll show you an example in a second too, but also the type of feedback that we give to participants to motivate them to persist and to continue, uh, also the types of incentives. So overall, we really also have to look at the design of the training, the design of the games, to make sure that these elements are relevant and that they add to how we are doing the task rather than making it more dis difficult and distracting. And I'm showing an example of this. So we have done uh, um, some studies with children in which, which we had various um, uh, iterations of the game and then we um, threw all sort of motivational features at this game to um, hopefully make this engaging. So we had points and um, um, uh, uh, tracking systems and badges and, and different narratives, all sort of things. Everything that we threw that we, we felt would make this game motivating and we, we measured how much they learned from doing this training. And yes, these kids improved a little bit. It was not super impressive, but, um, but that was the most gamified game that we had in this series of experiments. But then we also um, systematically took out some of these motivational features in the, the end to have a very simple, very 
boring task in our eyes that was just training without any points, any levels, not anything. And lo and behold, these kids improved much more on this training task as compared to the ones where we threw all these motivational features at. And the question is why, right? So the way we designed it there too was also distracting for these kids. They were much more engaged in figuring out, oh, how many points did I get? And how, how um, and, and kind of paying attention, not to the core aspects of the task, but to these features that were not relevant to what we were supposed to train. And this is really critical when we design games that should uh, maximize your working memory skill to be really careful on how we implement some of these features. So this is an example of a game that um, was designed at the Brain Game Center. Um, and this was one of our, or, or um, Aaron's first NBAC game, that was also trying to, to put in place a lot of these motivational features to make it engaging. But also here, you can imagine, we showed yesterday, we showed a, a few of you uh, this example of this game, and there was some eye rolling there already that it was very complicated, it was very difficult. So even this gamified version of, of the Zenback task could be super exciting for some people, it can be overwhelming for others. And there's a, a question of whether we should start with very simple games and then ramp it up and, and improve and add on these motivational features so that they are becoming more relevant as people are more knowledgeable, they learned how to deal with the game, and they're not, no longer distracted. But once we are training for 10, 15 sessions, just doing the boring game can be boring, right? So there, it can be important to really improve and um, increase some of these motivational features. Because we really want continuous engagement with, with the game, and we were also able to show that continued engagement also, not surprisingly, the more you engage you are in training, the more you benefit and the more you learn uh, from training. Another thing also matters too, so how much you believe that what you are doing is actually relevant, and it's actually something that you can improve. If you come into a training and think, oh, there's no way I'm going to improve in this, there's probably not very much that you will benefit from this training if you think this is something that's fixed. And yes, this also translates to some of these um, reasoning outcome measures. So the more you think that your working memory, your cognitive skills are malleable, the more likely it is that you also show these benefits. And um, in addition to introducing these gamified elements in the task, the question is also how can we all directly target motivation and engagement in order to, for people to really believe in themselves, foster their self-efficacy skills uh, for them to engage with the training and also persist with training. And we have been running a, a number of studies and we have a, a new big project that we're starting on with adolescents with ADHD in which we uh, work with motivational coaching in order to support them during the working memory uh, training to emphasize the importance of engaging with the training, the importance of persisting with training, and also the emphasizing the importance of agency. It's really in each individual's agency to engage with the training and, and to work on their skills that they have. So this is just an example to, to show you how we did this uh, in older adults. So we had these uh, weekly coaching sessions in a group where people came together, they talked about their progress in the working memory game, and they talked with our coaches about um, um, difficulties that they had, uh, they talked about goal settings, and we really also um, talked through them uh, in a way to emphasize the costs and the benefits of having an engaged lifestyle and engaging in these different types of training, not just the working memory training, but throughout um, their lives. And um, we the current directions that we have in addition to these more lab-based, the smaller studies, we're also in the process of collecting lots and lots uh, of data. So we're in the process of uh, training up to 30,000 participants who are doing all the assessments and the training online, so they're doing everything on their phones um, or their tablets, with the goal for us to really figure out what types of training results in 
uh, what types of uh, transfer. So we have different kinds of uh, training interventions and we, we focus also on figuring out the, the boundary conditions of these generalizing effects. And we are very interested also to better understanding for whom um, certain training tasks work and um, for whom they don't. And again, that all leads to um, uh, future personalization of training so that we can select the types of training that could be relevant for for each individual and everyone can contribute and, and can participate in their training so we have the QR code here but also the tiny URL if anyone is interested and of course people can reach out to us too but it's really self um, um, uh, generated so people sign up they go through the training and they they do also the assessments everything online so going back to um, putting everything together that Aaron was talking to you about and what I was talking to you about. So we think that designing the interventions for success, we, we have to think about several aspects. One starts at the measurement, and we had wonderful conversation today too about how we can measure uh, indices of brain health, uh, but also in general cognition. So we need very precise uh, measures where we can understand, first of all, what people's individual strengths are, what their needs are, how can we s um, uh, measure them, and that they are also um, sensitive enough to pick up very subtle changes across um, different time points, so before training, after training. If someone performs already at 100% before training, there's nowhere uh, they can go. So we need measures that are very precise in, in capturing some of these uh, changes across time. And we also need to focus on design frameworks and, and taking this uh, personalized approach on training, recognizing that people have different strengths and different needs, and the interventions really need to be uh, tailored to each individual to in, in order to, going back to the motivational features, if it's not targeted towards you, if it's not tailored to you, you won't have any interest to this and you would, will not be able to stick with the training. And that, here it's highlighting the, the importance of support structures, so the motivational coaching that I was touching on before, but also so social support system can be used, and in general motivational frameworks that help people effectively engage and persist with uh, interventions. And then other things that we have recently started to go into is also the importance of um, thinking about a more, in, in embedding multiple components into a training. So not just doing working memory training, but what if we added physical exercise to that? What if we added other art-based intervention, music-based interventions, or other uh, nutrition, sleep interventions? Everything that will interact to pr produce the positive outcomes. So here, more is definitely more, so where we can find out how to maximally um, uh, capitalize on, on these beneficial effects of all these different kinds of interventions. And with that, I'm closing here and we, we open it up for questions, but here are some of our team members that we have now at Northeastern uh, at, our, uh, at our labs and the funding um, uh, people who provide funding for us. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, thanks so much, Aaron and Susan. Um, am amazing talk, really such a thought-provoking set of objectives. And I will confess, I was one of the people that tried the um, navigation and back, and I was really quite bad at it. So I might be, I, I lacked belief though. I needed my inner Yoda voice more. Yes, and there was a complicating factor of really nice wine had been served. So I'm not going into the Air Force. But uh, we do have time for questions. So let's um, kick things off um, with Cecilia. I'm very interested in what you think and how you perceive the word brain training and using the term training. I saw you using it generally at the beginning as brain training and then you bring it into each of the type of training and you continue calling it training. And it's a term that we struggle with a little bit here and I'm just wondering what your point of view is on that. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit that I'm a little bit challenged both by you know, using the term, because I think that it 
is very vague, um, and a lot of things go under the umbrella, and people don't agree on which. Uh, but I'm also unsure about not using the term, because a lot of people are familiar with the concept. And so I, I definitely have been part of many conversations of how to create a more nuanced vocabulary. Um, but like I kind of feel like every talk or every audience, like uh, one side or the other. But um, it is a complicated term. And I think especially given that there's a lot of people who are kind of pushing products under that terminology, and there's not agreement that those products are necessarily always good for people. Can your uh, visual perception research, is that being applied in ways that could help improve function in people with low vision, like due to macular degeneration? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so I've used that program a little bit in macular degeneration, but one thing that is important if you're looking at people, so if you're macular degeneration, what this means is that you have lost some of your central vision, and so that, um, what we often want to do for training is use an eye tracker so that we could basically measure where they're looking and kind of help them look in a way that's going to be using their preserved vision effectively. And so we actually have multiple um, NIH funded trials that are looking at eye tracker based interventions for macular degeneration that use these same design principles that I said, but I think one thing which is really important is that as you understand kind of unique needs that different people have, you have to take those into account when you're designing the interventions. And so we have a different class of interventions for macular degeneration than we have for the baseball players in this case. Um, I have a question with regard to the maintenance of the benefits. Has there been any research done on how long or if they, or are they expected to be maintained over a period of time? And also the same question in a sense for the baseball players. Um, obviously, um, are you looking at the same people a, a year from now because obviously baseball players move on to a different team or they no longer play baseball? Is it the same cohort of people that you're yeah, I, I'll start with the baseball players. And so basically, so there we yeah tested the same people year after year. In fact, we even got some of the players two years later. And basically, we saw that there was maintenance, uh, some maintenance and some forgetting. Um, so but they were better than where they started. And other studies of perceptual learning have also tested people years later and found that there are some savings. Mm -hmm. With working memory, it's a little bit more complex. Well, let Susan take that one. Yeah, it's, but it's a great question, right? So it, it is a little bit more complex, like Erin said, but we have also tested people six months up to a year later, too, and found some um, uh, um, evidence for maintenance effects. And even some of these puzzling studies in children where we didn't see very much going on immediately after training, but a couple of months later, that's when they suddenly um, were showing some of these benefits. And the question is why? And one of the hypotheses that we have is, too, when, when you have these kids for a number of weeks, they're training on their working memory skills, they also need some time to be able to implement some of these uh, uh, learned skills into other domains. And that might just take time to, to, to manifest. Um, so that's one of the things that we see. And we see that quite often. Um, but there's also the question, if you would just train for these four weeks and then you never do anything again, probably you would not expect any of these benefits to last very long. So it's really important to also continue to um, foster or con continue to foster some of these skills. And these could be also be done through other means, not just the working memory training. Um, so that's the more complicated part. Right? We don't n really know how long does it really last and what is it that you have to do in order to maintain some of these benefits. I think when you could take the physical exercise analogy is that if you basically go to a four week boot camp and exercise a lot, and then afterwards you lead a more healthy lifestyle, then basically you could see you know, um, benefits that will last for a while. If you then instead go to a more donut forward lifestyle, <laughs> then you know, maybe these gains will lose um, and you need to go back to that boot camp.
Oh. Okay, I'm thinking back to um, one of the first slides that you showed about some of the other applications for cognitive training, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the connection between mental health and cognitive training. Yeah, I'll start. Um, and so the way that I think about kind of mental health is, I know people are kind of familiar with like um, National Gym Mental Health's um, you know, our doc framework, but basically, you know, there's kind of a couple ways of thinking about mental health. One is you think about the DSM where you have, you know, specific diagnostic criteria for um, ADHD or schizophrenia or um, other conditions. And that framework is a little bit complicated for the cognitive training perspective. The, this RDOC framework is basically saying that, well, across all these different conditions, Things like working memory are affected in certain ways. Um, things like inhibitory control are affected in different ways. Um, and that you know you could also look at genetic factors. You could look at um, brain activity, et cetera, and so on. And that basically that style now basically gives a nice opening for cognitive training. Is that if you could start understanding what are the core cognitive components that might be at need for, let's say, someone with ADHD, then suddenly, okay, well, training things like sustained attention and working memory, um, and even in some cases, uh, you know, perceptual training, um, you know, in principle can be beneficial. The challenge, though, is then you start realizing that, um, you know, you could take 10 kids with ADHD, and they're very different from each other. And so now you need to start figuring out, okay, if we're trying to look at this more kind of RDOC neuroscience approach of understanding mental health, now we need different categories and there are different phenotypes you would have otherwise. And some of them might be really good candidates for cognitive training and other than not so much. And this is where it becomes challenging, but I think there's great opportunity there. We, we will go to an online question. So this is one related to the multi-sensory uh, training styles you alluded to. If someone is, for example, Im has impaired vision, how could you train something like working memory without vision? And, and maybe that's that could be broadly um, in any population where there's sensory difference. Can you uh, do you have thoughts on how to make generalizable training for those populations? I mean, we also have auditory versions of of the tasks as well. So. And, and since working memory is often domain general, right? So um, we have seen some evidence if, if you train on an auditory version of an NBAC task, there's some generalizations on visual or other types of, of, of tasks too. So you could still train an auditory version on the task and, and still improve your working memory more generally. Um, but you might have some other thoughts too on the multi-sensory part as well. Yeah, so I think the key thing is, um, you know, it gets back to this kind of precision measurement that I think is really important, is that for anybody, you basically want to kind of understand their individualized kind of strengths and weaknesses. And then ideally, kind of have the training that is going to be able to reach them in relationship to their goals. And so for instance, if you have somebody who is blind, then you probably would not want to have a vision training component. Um, but maybe you want to look at something that would be auditory and tactile. Um, if you have somebody who has low vision, then maybe you want to look at how you could use sound to support the visual perceptions and basically build upon that. And then maybe um, with time, put more reliance upon the visual side of things. And I think with everybody, it's a different story. And this is the place where, once again, I, I think it gets hard, but this is, the big opportunity is you know, being able to have it so that these trainings are adapted to people's individualized kind of, um, kind of needs and goals. Um, and in some cases, that is going to be changing how one relies upon the different senses. OK, uh, fantastic. Uh, thanks so much. And thank you for the thoughtful questions. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. We'll be back in, a, in two weeks on the 9th of February with Jonas Kaplan from the Institute of Creativity and Neuroscience at USC, talking about the narrative brain. We look forward to seeing you there. And let's once again thank Susan and Aaron for this excellent talk.